We are back with the Blowjack Podcast. I'm Kevin Sully in a booth in Austin, Texas. Joined on the road, Gordon Mack in a supply closet? Where are you? You're very close to the camera. What's going on? Oh, it's a I'm hotel in, room. I'm in a hotel room. I'm in a hotel room in Flagstaff. And I have, I think, worse internet than you, but I have better audio now than you. And you're in a you're you're in a soundproof booth, and my internet and audio is better because something's janked up about your computer, man. What's going on? Yeah, listen, we've been doing this remote thing for about a year. My USB ports have given up. They said it's time to go. Nothing works in the correct order. Like one computer's internet is good, but the USB ports don't work. The other one, the USB ports work, but the internet is bad. This is the first time I think I've done a podcast ever with no headphones on. I feel really strange. I feel really free. I feel loose. I might say go in a different direction than anybody is ready for just because it feels like you and I are talking. The audio, I apologize. So as you're listening might be a little bit, uh, a little bit worse, but Hey, we'll figure it out. We'll get rolling. Uh, before we go and talk about the results of the weekend, how's your, how's your trip been? I know it's been a while since you've been in Flagstaff about three or four days. So how has it been? Yeah, the trip's been pretty wild. So we were here filming a thing with the Under Armour Dark Sky team, but naturally, when you're in flag, they're not the only ones here. Basically, the entire running mecca is here. And we went to Sedona, which, for those who don't know, it's like 2,000 feet uh, lower elevation from Flagstaff that a lot of athletes go to to do harder workouts. And we went there twice. But notably, on Friday afternoon, we went there to film a workout with the Dark Sky women but when we show up there's like literally 50 plus elite athletes all on the track doing a different workout there's molly seidel was there molly huddle was there charlie grice erica villa the dark sky team ellie ellie pure all the new balance women were there like you name it they were there and they were all doing different workouts and it was cool because everyone is doing their own workout but they would like hop into each other's workouts if they knew they were doing similar pace so Mm -hmm. like rachel schneider she did a workout solo but she ran in four different other groups workouts throughout the entire uh session because she's like oh you're doing 70s okay i would hop in there oh you're doing a some faster oh you can take me through 400 cool and everyone was kind of like working off each other they're all were like cheering each other on it was a really interesting environment like super positive So it was Mm -hmm. cool. So we did that and then um, got a couple workout Wednesdays. And then we did some interviews on Saturday. And then Sunday went to the long run, uh, which is a very popular thing in Flagstaff where uh, Stephen Haas, who's like the orbiter of, I don't know if that's the right (laughs) word, the oracle or orator, the order of Flagstaff running. Um, He says where the long run is going to be and then everyone shows up. Uh, and so we went to film the long run and, oh, we got, come, we got a guest coming in. We got my girlfriend, Jojo coming back with some coffee, <laughs> excuse her. Uh, but the long run was cool. Harvard was there, the Harvard track team. Oh, wow. So I guess they, they realized, Hey, our season isn't happening. So let's just go train and flag for the spring. Um, but yeah, overall being flag is just fun. You're surrounded by running. You're surrounded by, you know, great downtown environment. And then I'm staying here all week because I'm going to go hiking in Grand Canyon, Sedona. It's going to be a good time. But enough about How that. How many? Anyway, cool content for me to put up on the internet for you guys to watch later on this month. So I just have one question. That track scene that you painted sounds awesome. And I feel like someone needs to do a video of that. Just the, the teamwork and the camaraderie of it all. It's like jazz music, basically, right? You're Im- improvising. Yeah. Like, you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. It's pretty cool. How many times was the word track yelled, though, at all? Did you hear anybody? Not really that much, to be honest. Because they know I what they're doing, right? But they all know. They have, like, this yeah. sixth sense to know when the track is 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 hot. And the people just knew to stay out of lane one and two at all times. But you would just constantly see people, you know, It's not – I think it's more controlled in a weird way because it's not like anyone's ever going to be doing – there's not like a sprint group there or like someone doing like a crazy like hurdle drill or anything like that. Everyone's basically in lane one. So you kind of know that's just like the the freeway and then you get get on the on-ramp at the start line and then you get off 
and get back on. So it's kind of like a moving freeway, the lane one at Sedona. Another content idea. We come back this time next year. We dress you up. We disguise you. We put you in lane one jogging 10, 30 miles and mic you up and just hear what people say to you. Oh, that'll be fun. Yeah, yeah. And I just like have headphones on, like big yeah. headphones. So I like have ankle weights and everything and just like, like, God, oh, that'll be fun. Troll, trolling a track workout team. That'll be fun. And then, yeah. and then you reveal yourself later and they're like, oh, great. Thanks, Gordon. Really appreciate you ruining the workout. We hate you even more now. Uh, we got great reviews with Lincoln on the pod last week. Like the chat was blowing up. Lincoln's back. Lincoln's back. I, and no one was saying, oh, I'm glad he's here and Gordon's gone. But it was just, it was nice to, to hear that, that Lincoln is back. I don't know if you saw the video. He hasn't cut his hair in, in months. Uh, I think he's fallen on hard times a little bit. Just kidding. He's doing great. Uh, also wanted to plug before we started uh, the other show we got going on, On the Run. Uh, with Serenity Douglas. She got two episodes up. First one was with Kenny Harrison. The second one was with Marquis Dendy. If you haven't checked it out, you should do that right now or right after this episode. Also, if you want to comment in the chat while we're watching, we already got one positive comment from the Saxy Life. Let's go. The Mac is back. So here we go. If you got comments go. in the chat, leave them right now. I want to start first, Gordon. I want to start first with a meet that we had on Flow Track and the emergence of a new American steeple star that's right i said it a steeple star courtney wayman of byu her first steeple since 2017. what does she do gordon what does she do she runs 9 31 37 puts her fourth on the ncaa list behind who well courtney frericks jenny simpson emma coburn and colleen quigley the big four of american women's steepling she's already there in just her first race again since 2017. She had good competition in this race, theoretically with Hannah Steelman, who is an All-American herself, very credentialed runner, and Weymouth just ran away with this thing. I think we are gonna see Weymouth break the collegiate record this year, Gordon, when she gets another chance to run it. I think she's going to kind of bridge that gap that we're gonna see once the Coburn, Frericks, Quigley, era when it ends eventually which is not going to be anytime soon but Wayman right there with with Ali Ostrander already in terms of PBs and what you get from Wayman Gordon is you get somebody who's good on the flat already right like we talked about her being a 5000 meter favorite so if you take the fastest woman or one of the fastest women already in the flat 5 or when you go back to the indoor season the NCAA champion in the flat 3 and then you put her in the steeple this is the, the result that you get. So Weymouth, big favorite. Steeple on the women's side this year is sneaky good in the NCAA. We talked about Camelli running 937 this year, but Weymouth is the, the top of the list. I think she's going to be a factor when, you, when it comes time for the trials as well, too. You put a lot of uh, trust in a 931 steepler to like not only improve Debut. by another eight, eight seconds, and then be already in the conversation with the Quigleys and Coburns and Frericks of this world. Well, I mean, no, she I'm did saying have a good indoor season, but like she didn't like run like nine twenty. I'm not saying she's going to beat them in the trials. I said she's going to be factor in the trials. Okay. I think obviously top. I mean, top five is a possibility. You think top five is out of the question for the trials? Oh yeah, I mean anyone can get fourth. That's yeah. the top three are the the known, and then anyone could be fourth in that race. So, and if you run nine thirty one, you are you can be fourth. Uh, mm -hmm. But, I mean, she didn't get – one thing that, that – not to – she didn't get the standard out of it. So we do know she has to run another fast race to try to get mm -hmm. the Olympic standard, and maybe she will, you know, push it at NCAAs, or maybe she'll try to run NCAA prelims really quick. Uh, but, yeah, you're right. I mean, Courtney Wayman, what was her PB before this race? 10-0 something. Doesn't matter. 10 10. Start with the 10. That's wild to go that long without steepling and go from then all of a sudden, like, do you, how do you even remember how to steeple if you don't yeah. go for that long? Like, did, was she still like practicing steepling or was she like taking like a whole four year sabbatical off of even going over barriers? Do you know? I don't think she had been going over many barriers until this past season. And that's why I think the collegiate record is going to go down this year, just because the rep of doing the race the second time is going to help 
immensely because it's not like you steeplers aren't doing like mock steeples in practice in the same way that 5,000 runners aren't doing mock 5,000s all out in practice. But steeple, there's the added technical element. There's the added time over the barriers. So if you put her in a race with Camelli and have another race under her belt, I think you're just going to see a huge bump up because if the last time you ran it was four years ago and you're running 10, you're a completely different runner now. So your experience running it is not, not really tr perfectly transferable to where you're at right now, which is why I'm so optimistic on what she's going to do the rest of the, the rest of the season. We should mention that this race almost didn't even happen. The yes. men's yeah. and women's steeple at the West Coast Relays almost got canceled. For those who are watching it, they might have been confused what was happening in the middle right before the, the good races started. Uh, yeah. But there was a rolling blackout that hit Clovis, California, where the entire stadium was shut, turned off, basically. No power, no internet, no nothing, completely dark. Uh, so we lost the stream for a little bit. Luckily, we were able to – they postponed the meet by like an hour or so. And then mm -hmm. they decided to like, all right, we figured it out. We're going to do a track meet in the dark. And we recorded it to tape. And you can see we had uh, athletes line the track with cell phones. <laughs> so they had a little light rail. What I want to know wow. is did they send each other text messages to each cell phone to get their own virtual light pacer around the track where it lit <laughs> up because it said, hey, we need, we need to give them 336 pace in the 1500. So it's send a text every one second to get across around the track. That would have been yeah. amazing, but they didn't do that. Well, uh, they were incredibly resourceful to get this thing up and going. And they obviously, they prioritized the, those, those 1500s, obviously, because they couldn't steeple in the dark. That sounds like a horrible yeah. idea for anybody involved. Even your worst enemy, you don't want them steepling in the dark. And they may do with it. I mean, this is in, this was incredible. I think, I mean, it's great towards the end they got them back working right so we got it for the steeples we got it for those elite 5ks where i know you're excited to see the, the close of that men's race because you you kind of nailed this one i don't know we don't have the tape handy yet we're not up to that level of production but i believe you said your is going to go out at 13 40 pace and then kick down with like a 55 close to 1330 or maybe you said 1330 pace and kick down to 1320 but Basically, the elements were there for what you said because his close was ridiculous here. And I know it was off of a relatively conservative pace, but 54 on that close just blew everybody out of the water with a with a 13, 29. What are the updated – we need the updated Gordon 5,000 rankings now. Well, before I give you, let's fast forward on this video to about the – 600 meters to go mark for Grijalva. So really testing going. the limits of Travis's just, right. production. So here he goes. Here. All right, just let's just watch this. For those listening to the pod, just go on the website and link up the audio to this video. But, all right, 600 to go. He takes the lead. And just look how quickly the lead gets expanded over Dressel. So, all right, it's a little more. So he just started. Now it's already like mm -hmm. five meters. But then on the back, eventually on the back stretch of his last 400 when he closes in 55, look at this. He is already yeah. 15 meters now after the first 100 meters. Now it's probably 20 meters. And he went out 600 to go. It is completely over mm -hmm. after the 200 with the lap to go already. And then look at that. Look at that. He, has like a, he ran him out of the screen. He ran him out of the screen from 600 to go to 400 to go would be the best way to describe yeah. it if you're not able to. To watch this video and then by the back stretch then with 300 to go he's up 30 40 meters at that point and this thing is all she wrote now who is this the who is this the strategy to beat because he has to like his kick more than kip too he's got to like his kick more than kurgot so it doesn't make sense for him to be the aggressor is this the strategy to beat one of the oregon guys if they're in this race is this the strategy to beat he's somebody else he knows he can beat the he knows he can beat Tier because he's already outkicked Tier in a fast race when he ran 1316. So mm -hmm. the really only unknown wild card is if Hawker does the 5K, can he outkick a Hawker, right? Because Hawker right yeah. now is showing that no one can beat him. I'm thinking though, my sources are telling me that I think Hawker might just do the 15. 
which then makes it even easier for Grijalva to win this 5K against a tier who's even already easier. You said even easier with a men's 5K this year. Come on, man. Nothing's easy. Come Amen. On. But, like, we all, like, are – I think low-key, everyone is just forgetting that I think Luis Grijalva is the best 5K runner in the nation, and Yared Nagus is the best 1,500-meter runner in the nation. But we just don't know that because neither of them ran indoors. Neither of them have done a heavy loaded outdoor season. And so mm-hmm. therefore they're kind of just like, hey, guys, don't forget, we, we're pretty good too. I know like yeah. the stars of Oregon and Iowa State are doing their thing up front. But when it all comes down to it, I think Notre Dame and Northern Arizona are going to show up pretty well. But we'll have to wait and see. Yard and Goose was supposed to be in this 1500 at the West Coast Relays, but they scratched out. Yared hasn't run anything since his 5K in March, so maybe he's yeah. a little banged up. I don't know. Uh, but the 5K, once again, they're now, I looked it up, 17 men have broken 1330 in the 5K in 2021. Only two men did it in 2019. It was, mm-hmm. it's just insane. Yeah. Like the men's 5k is just wild. I'm in love with it. You know, <laughs> as you can see on the screen, I'm in love with the 5k. This is wild. Yeah. Uh, NAU wise, I think they had a good, good meet. You saw Abdi Ahmed Nur put down a good 10k in the morning when lights were not necessary at all. Blaze Farrow ran well in that race too. So they got all their, their people through. Going back to the that women's five, Ellie Hennis, man, she laid down the lumber there. I don't know how else to put it. Just like she was right on the rabbit's shoulder. She was almost inching out to lane two for a lot of this. And you were kind of wondering, man, she must just feel really good because she's trying to – she's like basically getting on the rabbit to go even quicker. And then with 2K to go, it was just her. The rabbit steps off. And she doesn't slow. Like she just keeps grinding and grinding and grinding. She ends up running 15, 18, a big PB for her, puts her second in the nation right now. You know, we don't know where a lot of these women are going to race. You talked about that last week. We don't know who's doing steeple, who's doing five, who's doing 15. It, it's all over the place. But you look at a race like that from Hennis and the confidence that she showed there. You have to you have to like her her chances with only a month to go or six weeks to go in the season. Yeah, she's kind of been a very consistent runner her entire four to five year career at NC State, um, and I think this is kind of the first time she's thrown down a mark that's like separating yeah. herself from the field. She's always been like in that group of, yeah, I'm a top eight top eight runner, but now this is like, hey, I can. 15, 18, you don't see Whitney Orton doing that. You don't see uh, – I mean, Mercy Chalanga did do that. She ran about 15, 16, 17. So she basically right. ran the same time as the cross-country champ. So she's definitely in the conversation. Well, we look at the results from this race. I mean, it was fast, not just – I mean, it had us one going away, but it wasn't because people didn't bring their A game. You know, Donahue with a 1529, Prowse with a 1529, Terranilla with 1536. Those are fast – fast times in the same way we talk about the men's times just going up another level this year so good runs there but Hennis by far the the class of the field second best in the NCAA this year okay I want to talk about those 1500s that took place when the lights were out those premier 1500 meter races because we got to see Gordon those races who was born in the dark and who merely was adopted by the dark they, they were the Bain 1500s there. Uh, which one do we – we got one coming up here, uh, queued up here. Let's just roll whichever one that is, and we can we can talk about it. What was your what were your takeaways from – I guess this is first the, uh, the women's 1500. Yeah, I mean, there's just so much depth now in the women's 1500. I, I heard a stat the other day. I think 20-plus women have broken 420 in the 1500 this year. Where in 2019, it was only like four, four or five. So, yeah. like, everyone is running quicker. Uh, we saw a good race here between Whitney Orton and the rest of the field. At, um, Chrissy Gear gets the win. I, I'm sorry, I'm losing track of 
uh, the names. But who is exactly who's the Chrissy Gear at four hundred nine? I should know this. Gear. Your your audio is cutting out, Kev. So maybe we should Chrissy take down Gear. This, this, uh, the, the, the. Oh yeah, Gear. Chrissy yeah, Gear. I'm yeah, Gear. Yeah, my bad. Gear, who is a steepler, another person who's <laughs> is she still? She could maybe. I think so, but like if you're four hundred nine speed, maybe that is the solution to the win the steeple. But yeah, gear four hundred nine flat, and then Orton right behind her four hundred nine thirty one. Yeah. Can't I mean BYU had what four women break four fifteen? Yeah, uh, and then Caitlin Tui, the freshman four fourteen. Everyone was talking about that. Uh, good PB. I guess this is PB PB for her um, season, but. It just shows the depth that someone like Tui can finish ninth in this race, run 414, and there can be eight other women who are all running quicker and led by Chrissy Gear, 409 flat. Well, she was, Tui was there with three, like 300, 400 to go. Like she was right on Orton's shoulder. She was not shy at all. She fell back. But again, another NC State runner showing confidence in the early moments of the race. And that's a good sign for her. But yeah, Orton, I think doesn't really want to be in the position of, I mean, no, Myler wants to be in the position of leading. So I wouldn't read too much into this. I mean, great run for gear, especially considering we know her more as a, as a steepler, but yeah, I thought going into the weekend, I said this on, was a Wednesday, we'd be talking about Herda and Orton as the 1500 meter co-favorites. Well, Herda didn't run in this meet, correct? and. Orton got beat. So that prediction for me was was a bit off. I think you have more confusion than anything in the the 1500 than you did like going into the weekend because now there's look at I mean look at the just the glut of people there at the top. Cuz BYU could put Orton in the 5, right? Now and then put Camp in the 15. And with the way Anna Camp closes, right. I think something's happening. I think I lost all that. Elon, did people hear that normally, or is that just yeah. me going crazy? Yeah, that's on your end, Gordon. Okay. It was a great point. I'm not going to lie. I heard, yeah, I heard just a robotic talk the entire time. I think it's because I tried to load TFERS, and then my internet <laughs> can't handle the TFERS top 500 list, and then we, we lose, uh, I lose connection with you. Uh, but whatever you said, I'm sure it's great. I'm sure the audience appreciated mm-hmm. that take, that high level take that you gave. Um, mm-hmm. What I, wanted to talk about was the men's race one yeah. sam prakel he he runs 336 every time he goes he's just really good at running 336 uh we talked about once again every time an elite male us 1500 meter runner doesn't run 335 another uh angles and uh central get their wings uh because mm-hmm. once again we don't see it now there are still more big opportunities for 1500s. You have one at Mount Sac uh, this weekend. There'll probably be another one at Sound Running. Maybe an NCA final goes fast. I don't know. But right now it's looking good for the three people with the Olympic standard in the 1500. But I think the big takeaway I thought from this race was BYU. <laughs> Connor Mance, a 10K runner, in 337. If you look at the Tifers, like top uh, 10, they have like five guys in the 1500. Mm-hmm. It's just wild. Uh, yeah. Talon Franco, uh, they have uh, Lucas Bonds. Casey Klinger ran like a fast converted mile that converts to a fast 1500. And then Casey Klinger, I, I mean, Connor Mansour obviously isn't going to run the 15, but maybe he does. Maybe he's like, hey, let's stay fresh for the 10K at the trials and let's run the 1500. <laughs> he didn't like all those podcast. comments. He didn't like all those comments about us saying he needs to start his kick on Thursday if he's going to be competitive in the 1500 on Friday. And he stuck his nose right in there. This is impressive. On the other side of the of the coin, Washington. What do you make of Washington's performance here in the 1500? Sam Tanner, who was a star indoors, runs a 334, was here, you know, in the mix with 100 to go and just went, we got the results up here, you know, just went backwards over the latter portion of that race. And it's just, you would, obviously, Franco and Bonds, you'd be, you're not surprised that they did well for BYU, but it's almost like the Washington and BYU results are, are flipped here, Gordon, after that. Yeah, and I was talking to someone here in Flag about Sam Tanner's performance, and 
they kind of reminded me like Sam just got announced to the Olympic team a few weeks ago. And I think once that happened, you're kind of, your focus shifts and you realize, okay, I need to be at my best in August now, not in June. And maybe I need to start kind of resetting my season and maybe running a 335, 1500 in May isn't the best thing for me or getting prepared to do that. So maybe his, his training kind of took a, a step back and go back into base phase to kind of build up to August, which could be a reason why someone like Sam Tanner can run 338 and not really be in his sharpest, like 335 shape. Mm -hmm. So makes, makes, makes some sense, makes some sense, but it's just, I don't know, it's still like a, a surprise because after he ran that time at the New Balance meet indoors, you thought, okay, this is going to be, the guy or one of the guys, him and Nagus, or then when Hawker put his name out there, those, those three, uh, interesting to see how it develops, but the men's 15 is super deep. We got the top 15 list here. Uh, Travis can pull up Tifers without pulling the show to a complete halt. So we'll have to do that. <laughs> let you look at the screen here, <laughs> but yeah, Ilya kept saying up front while he's Suleiman, Marcia, Mario Garcia, Romo, then, then the BYU contingent starts, starts rolling in there pretty deep obviously there's going to be some some scratches here but the common theme is just fast all around this year where's uh cole hawker cole hawker is now 20th yeah it is funny right he looks so good in that 15 but he just hasn't done one since and he's the 1500 meter favorite and now he's 20th (laughs) yeah it's wild that's why pb's uh predicting a the results based off of just who has the fastest PB is never a good option when it comes to distance races. Unless you're Billy yeah. Kipchoge, then it's a good he's way got, to predict. He's, he's got, well, everybody's got basically two weekends left. And he's got Twilight, Oregon Twilight, and then the conference meet. And that's pretty much it. And some people who don't have conference might run that sound running meet in, in, in California. But that's that's pretty much it in terms of trying to run fast. And since if you're looking towards the trials too, that's basically the amount of times you have to run quick between now and the Olympic trials, unless you get a quick one at the NCAA meet, which it might be fast, but if you're trying to run 13, 15 in the 5K to get the Olympic standard at the NCAA final, that might be a little bit too much to ask. So these next two weeks, you're really going to want to pay attention to. Yeah, got to pay attention. I will be hiking during uh, the Mount Sac meet, so I won't really know much. I'll be updating my phone with bad cell service, see what's happening mm-hmm. on track, man. What else happened this weekend? Anything happened on the sprint side? I well on the NCAA yeah I want to talk about Br- Bromel here I obviously want to talk about the, the the teenagers for the United States running ridiculous times but while we're on the topic of uh, the NCAA Michael Williams ran really fast for Oregon 10-0 and then North Carolina A and T's 400 Trevor Stewart dropped a good one 44-52 Randolph Ross has also gone 44-69 and Elijah Young 45-98 there some depth for A&T, North- and Stewart is, is looking pretty good, too. North Carolina A&T's conference, the MEAC, is going to be live on Flow Track in two weeks, mm. so check that out. That should be good. You see this footage of Stewart running 44-5. I mean, it's no Noah Williams 44-3, am I right? Because There we go. There we go. Finally Noah giving Williams. him his due. Took two months. <laughs> Took two months and getting called out on Twitter for – Gordon to admit that you're strong. Yeah, I think it's gonna be a good race. You have obviously Williams, Deadman, Ross, Trevor Stewart, Blockberger from Arizona. The men's the men's four hundred is is getting excited. We got a late rush there by Randolph Ross over the last fifteen meters. Good close there by him. But let's talk Bromel. You want to talk Bromel? I'm let's ready to make it. a statement. I'm ready to talk, make a statement about Trayvon Bromel. It's it's almost like an election night call you know the the panel's talking and all of a sudden wolf blitzer puts his hand right here and he says i'm willing to say after this 988 that trayvon bromel has now moved into 
100 meter favorite for the Olympics. That's right. I am confirming this. Trevon Bommel, officially, we had him as co-favorite. I'm now officially moving him to title of favorite after his 988 run in Jacksonville. Well, I think your broadcast is a few weeks on delay because he's been the favorite in my books <laughs> for like the, before 2021 even started. He became the favorite as soon as he ran in back in 2020 summer. Uh, there was no reason. Uh, Noah Lyles hasn't done anything to show that he can compete with Bromel. I know Lyles is a slower starter in the season, and he kind of works his way into it, but Lyles is not Christian Coleman. And with no Christian Coleman, Bromel clearly is the favorite. And Justin Gatlin, he's going to be there. He's going to have the participation trophy of being able to qualify once again. But Bromel is going to be the one that's going to win it, provided he shows up, gets the job done, and is healthy. You were right to be early on it. I just was giving Lyles a little bit more time to come around. But look, this is Bromel over the last two years. He's beaten DeGrasse twice. This is the 100. Beaten DeGrasse twice, beaten Lyles twice, beaten Gatlin once. Now in the 60, he lost to Ronnie Baker. I'm not really worried right now about 60s. There's no 60 at the Olympics. Last I checked, maybe they'll try to shorten everything. <laughs> try to get everybody out of there quicker. Reasons. Yeah, exactly. Every, we, every event gets reduced by 60, 60%, right? So the 5K the gets dropped down. Yeah, the 10K is now the 6K. It's very confusing to everybody. That's not happening. Look, another just amazing start from Bromel. That is now the rule. It doesn't seem to be the exception. The big question is just the health. And every time we get closer, every day we get closer to the trials, that's one day of him being healthier and healthier and healthier and proving once again that he is solid sub 9-9. Nine, nine. Listen, times, whatever, especially in Florida, I feel like everybody runs fast in Florida all the time. You could go down there, Gordon. You could probably break 14 down in Florida. That's how quick those tracks in Florida are. But the important thing when I look at here is the margin of victory, right, and just how well he, he performed uh, at going out of the blocks. I mean, you can see it there if you're watching right now, and, or you can find that, that, that tweet from Romel this weekend. Pretty, pretty easy to it's find. Over. Yeah, it's over. Yeah. It's over it's after over. the first 20 meters. Yeah. It, it was pretty – it was pretty crazy. Actually, what's great, can we play audio from tweets? Because there's a there's low key like a really funny thing that the cameraman mumbles during this thing in the beginning. I don't know if we can play audio from tweets while we play it, but um, no, we can't. All right, next. I think that he just says like, "Damn!" Like ten minutes, ten second or one second into the race, he's just like, "Damn!" Because <laughs> it's over. You're right, one hundred percent, and that's what he did uh, last race right against a deeper field and that's what he did here too so bromel favorite so bromel is the now but we've been we're starting to see uh the 2024 class not class but the people who are going to be fast in 2024 olympics probably 2028 olympics yeah uh, yeah two high school juniors running out of their mind was it what was it also at this meet in jacksonville where, where, Florida, these high school, where, where these high school kids ran? I think I think so. Uh, let's so yeah, see. Arion Knight and Jalen Slade. They weren't. They is that a different Florida meet? Uh, both in Claremont. seventeen. Claremont. Both seventeen years old. Knighton runs nine ninety nine, ten oh seven, and Slade runs ten oh three, ten oh three. It's just wild. I mean, the nine ninety nine was plus two point seven wind. So not when legal, but comparatively, when Bromel broke 10 in high school, it was like four wind. When Bowling broke four, I mean, broke 10 in high school, it was like 4.0 wind. This is only 2.7 wind. That's not that much more. Uh, he clearly is running like what the professionals are running. And this is showing me he can make a U.S. final and potentially, potentially finish top six and then be on that Olympic four by one. The 10 0 in the final was just a, a 2.1 wind. Yeah. This, with both of these guys, with both of these guys, I think it's a really good sign for the 200 because I think that's where the spot is available this year because that's the way that event works out. And 
you know, Slade obviously has run fast 200s that 10, 2020 was win legal number four in U.S. history. Knighton, we've seen run a really good 200. I think there's more, there's going to be more opportunity, uh, even though it's going to be slim, is going to be in the 200. What I think is interesting here, Gordon, as we have more runners go pro in high school, like is the case with Knighton, and just in general train more professionally, train more with a few meets in mind as opposed to high school meets, you know, scheduling like a pro. I wonder if that means that the adjustment to going to something like the trials is going to be not as dramatic because they're not trying to put a round peg in a square hole of a season. He's probably training with the idea of my peak is the Olympic trials. Whereas really good high schoolers before, maybe they were looking at the state meet or those all-star meets post state meet, right? The New Balances, the Brookses, the whatever of the world, Indidises of the world, or in cross country, the NXNs or the Foot Lockers. But now that that's shifted and a lot of these top runners are opting out of a traditional high school season, I wonder if we'll see not as big of a, you know, speed bump on their way to these big time meets. Now I say that with the knowledge that in 2016, when Lyles and Norman were high school seniors, they ran about as well as you could have hoped in the Olympic trials. And they had run high school seasons themselves. But this just becomes more and more of a trend. And if they're treating themselves like pros, it would make sense that they would look at the Olympic trials as this is when I have to get ready, not, hey, this is a nice little bonus at the end of the season. It's like, no, no, this is the focus of the season. Do you know when – is are there USA Juniors this year? Oh, it's canceled. I don't know. They canceled it. Because does that mean – how are they picking – because isn't there, isn't there World Juniors this year? Sorry, I just find this out now. This is probably old news. Oh, so it looks like – okay. Never mind. I didn't mean to do it. So with no USA juniors, that's gonna be another like thing that these guys can kind of back up plan. So if the Olympic trials yeah. don't go as planned, they still have that opportunity to get some international experience later on in the in the summer as well. So mm -hmm. uh it's like kind of they that double dip where they can train for the trials, and if that doesn't work, they have that fallback where like they can still go back into the high school junior mode and you know, get their feet wet with competing against people of their age as opposed to people five, ten years older than them. Yeah, but I I don't know, their feet are pretty wet at this point. Like all these races that they're running in, these Florida type meets are filled with pros. Right? There's like a difference though, I feel. The but difference I think what's is, gonna happen is there's no expectations, there's no pressure, there's no hype around it like people don't even know this meet is happening until after the fact for the most part they're like oh it's this ha meet happened in florida and they ran fast you just such a different mentality when all of a sudden you realize oh this is it this is the race this is the one that matters and it you're you're just not as loose i feel like and so yes they're getting experience of racing against people that they will race against but they have yet yeah. to get the experience of the pressure well and the pressure, I think, will come at the trials, not just in the – like w with every round, it's going to come, right? There's going to be pressure in the hunt in the, the first round of the 100, the first round of the 200. It's not just something where they are only going to feel it if they get to the final. And then I think someone like Knighton is going to get invited to Diamond Leagues, especially – you know, he's sponsored, right? Especially if he makes a final of the U.S. trials. Like he's going to get invites to go compete overseas. I get your point that that's not a championship race. So the, the, the pressure is off, but he'll get to compete consistently against guys low 20s into the 19s. Um, got a comment in the chat here about the 100 might be more open than the 200 after the top spot. I just don't see that just because weird stuff always <laughs> happens at the trials and at championships. People get hurt. People randomly scratch out. 
Like it, it always seems like I, I know right now Lyles is solid, but Narex looks really good. You got Terrence Laird in there, tearing it up. There'll probably be somebody else there as well. But I, the, the 200 just seems to be, seems to find a way every big meet to have something go haywire in it to where that there's a, a open spot or a little bit, not even, not even like saying they're going to get top three, but a better chance to get into the final, make it higher, m- make it to a, a higher place. Because in a hundred, you got to think, I mean, it's great. You know, sub, sub 10 is nothing to sneeze at, but you got to think we talked about Bromel. We talked about Lyles. We talked about Gatlin. We talked about Baker. And then you have that all other crew there, right? Like Kyrie Kings run sub 10 this year. Craven Gillespie, Isaiah Young, except, you know, Michael Williams is now running 10 O's or like they're going to be sharp and ready to go. So the margin between making the final and, you know, not getting out of those semis is, is pretty small in, in, in both races, but I think it's even smaller in the hundred. What are your thoughts on uh world relays or, or lack of, world relays they probably should not have had them would be my takeaway i mean shout out to kenya gets the bronze they got third out of three teams in the mixed gender shuttle hurdle relay which is a favorite relay of mine but no this meet was like a blip on the radar and the thing was is it had the weekend all to itself a bit i mean yeah we were focused on the west coast relays from a collegiate perspective but globally, obviously you had Bromel running these fast times and these quick quick meets in Florida. But like they didn't put a Continental Tour on this weekend. They didn't put a Diamond League meet on this weekend. So they had the opportunity to do it. But when the U.S. doesn't run, when Jamaica doesn't run, when Canada doesn't run, and then when they take out all the distance races and then most of the good sprinters from the remaining countries opt out. I mean, we had Travis look this up before. The fastest 4 by 4 split was 45 seconds on the men's side of things. That's yeah, what you're going to get. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's what you're going to get when you don't have the best people compete. So it was a, it was a completely watered down event. I love the meets. I like the concept of the meets when it first rolled out, but this year did not work. Do you think there's a concern that the world relays could become like the continental cup? <laughs> is that like the disaster scenario not yeah the you know what i mean like where it's like oh yeah it's that one meet that no one really gives yeah. a crap about being at their best for you know i think a lot of i people, mean the Nether- I what I, sorry i think i was just said i think a lot of people ran uh the the earlier iterations of it because it was in the Bahamas, right? It was not a lot for the U S yeah. at least and the Caribbean There's no travel. And then you got, you had European countries and you had African countries come over too, but having people go to Poland, obviously that's better for the European nations, but I think you got to figure out a time and a place where it's going to attract the highest amount of people. Because honestly, like, I don't know, even if every team had like their, B team or like A slash B team, I can still kind of get into it because it's relays and relays are fun, right? Like if the U.S. runs fifty percent of their of their best people, like it's it, like Bromel runs and Ronnie Baker runs, and then two other guys who are ten O guys, like I'll still get into that. Like I'll still watch it. It'll be fun to see. Oh, Bromel's got a deficit. Can he catch people? Oh, in the four by four, like Phil's Francis is is even with Jamaica in the last leg. Like I'll I'll still I'll still watch that. But when it gets to this point, I mean, we each have obviously pr- prominent countries missing, and then half of the events are gimmick events. Like that's not any fun. Like I, I think I, most people would much rather watch a four by eight, right, than some of the events that they ran. Just have some sort of distance representation. Yeah, I think uh, the reason they don't do distance is apparently a lot of countries don't have good distance athletes, so it's a lot easier for a country to find a respectable 400 meter runner who won't get lapped versus finding a, a miler who won't get lapped. So I think that's the issue. I, yeah, but I think what you should try to do is put together six to eight team compelling fields. So you don't need the whole world running your four by eight, but can you get six teams? Can you get eight teams running a good four by eight? Yeah, you could do that. 
is that the same team though that's going to be able to put together a four by one that's good that's the problem it's just the same problem as in high school track or in college track not everybody's deep not everybody has yeah. the, the four by one and the four by 1500 Hey, right? like so you got to kind of figure out how to entice people how to entice a nation to bring an entire team even though they're going to get stomped in one event probably but they have a chance to get a medal in another event did kevin did you see that one uh race on sunday yesterday happened the sunday night on sunday night yeah it was it was it came down to there was like a close finish oh, at yeah, the end. Yeah. i think we I, I think we have video of it yeah, yeah travis can you yeah, pull yeah. it up i think we i think we do is this the is a tip-in involving the sixers that went well yeah, for the first I think time we have video. Right? Okay. So very funny. What what were your thoughts I'm on this, this little fin- copyright <laughs> violation? I'm reporting this to the NBA. Adam Silver, take down the channel. What are your thoughts on that finish of Ben Simmons uh taking it to your San Antonio Spurs? Well, it was Ben Simmons second made field goal of the game. Uh really impressed that Ben Simmons got shut down by a Spurs defense that did not have four starters. Just real impressive, real way to beat your chest uh after a win there. By, by the Philadelphia 76ers, really showed their championship medal. Uh, again, I was just surprised they were on the right side of a tip-in for once, so that was a good thing for them. So here's uh, the thing, fortunate, obviously, for people don't challenge know the podcast, calls down the stretch. for people who don't know, you're a diehard Spurs fan, I'm a diehard Sixers fan. We would have potentially been at this game. You went to Flagstaff. I went to Flagstaff instead, but... If I didn't, we, you and me would have been in the stadium together at this game. We, we would have fought. We, we would not have been good. That would have been a long ride home if we were drove. If we car, we we hope we didn't carpool on that situation. But like, would you have been mad at you? Here's me? my question. Would, would you have taken it out? On yeah, I'm 100 percent mad at you. Here's my question though. Uh, is that a word? Like, so Spurs rest everybody. Would I have rather just have them get blown out by 30 than have that happen? Yeah, probably. Because that was really annoying. Yeah, but it was Blocked also annoying that the Simmons. Sixers took the gas pedal off the gas, or foot off the gas pedal, and let you guys get back in the game. So That's not what happened. Spurs just outplayed them because they're a better team top to bottom. But All right. Anyway, okay, yeah. <laughs> East is weak this year. Uh, Divine Oduru, 1988. Big run for him. Excited to see what Divine does uh, this year. Obviously had a tough championship in, in Doha. This week coming up, Gordon, we got a lot of fun stuff this week coming up. You got we the do? Continental Tour. You got that. Uh, and, and, well, we have two Continental Tours, right? There's one in Japan and then also the yep. one at, at Mount Sac. Are you hearing anything when you were out in Flagstaff? Are you hearing anything about Mount Sac? Because it seems like this is going to be the meet when we get some sort of well, I guess the Eugene meet was was solid, but we're going to get a lot more people showing up. Like, this is going to look even more like a Diamond League, I believe. Yeah, I think it'll be similar to the Eugene meet, to be honest. I think the U.S. distance runners are basically kind of eyeing the Mount Sac meet and the sound running meet as the two kind of prep meet, prep races until they get ready for the trials. So I don't think it's going to be anything wild, but, I mean, we'll see. We'll see when we start seeing the entries. But, yeah, th- this weekend also, though, it's going to be a wild weekend for high school uh, track because the Florida and Texas state meets are this weekend, and they're both live on flow. And, as you know, Texas sprinters and Florida sprinters are the best in the country. And so mm-hmm. we could see some – I'm not sure if we'll see, like, a Matt Bowling type experience that we had in 2019, but there could be yeah. – uh, a low key runner from Texas or from Florida shows up and has an inc- an incredible double or something like that. Mm-hmm. We should Such also mention sudden. people bring it up in the chat, and I did not did not see this in the Claremont. Or I didn't see this in the results just because the Claremont stuff came across late. Elaine uh, Thompson ten seventy eight with a plus one point eight, so that's second in the world, obviously behind Shakari's. 1072. So I'm excited. I don't know if you you saw this, Gordon. You were traveling. Uh, last week they announced that Gateshead Diamond League Women's 100 with Richardson, uh, Thompson, Fraser Price, and Dina Asher-Smith. That's at the end of 
May. So you're getting four of the top five. I mean, maybe maybe the top four in the world right now squaring off in the women's hundred at the end of May. That should be a good litmus test for Richardson, who has yet to really. I mean, she's running well now. I mean, she's being she's consistent as hell. But again, I think there's something different about running in low key Florida meets versus like getting on yeah, a plane yeah. and going to the going through the whole process of like, this is the big leagues, you know? I mean, she's already a big leaguer, but she has yet to, to run in big league competitions that often. I mean, Prefontaine's really the only big league, I guess in USA's, Prefontaine in USA's from 2019 to the last big mm-hmm. league meet she's been in. Uh, so she needs to get her, I think it's smart for her. She should like do, if I were her, she should do like multiple diamond leagues to kind of be like normalize that, that world that, you know, well, process so so that when she goes to the Olympics, she's not like fish, like like kind of like in over her head. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think I think it's awesome that they're doing it, right? What other event are we going to see the top four medal contenders all race each other pre Olympics? You know, Dude, this would be the men's which one? NCAA five k. The men's NCAA five well, k. <laughs> Not the NCAA. I'm talking about I know, the I know, world. Joke, There's this whole big world. I know. There's this whole big world out there, Jordan, beyond the NCAA that I'm excited about. You make a good point. I I think of Florida and sprints the same way I think of like the BU meets and distance. It's like you go there, you get your PB or you get your confidence booster, but then you got to test it somewhere else. And wherever you test it, usually isn't as fast as BU or Claremont, but you're going to get better competition, and that's where the medals are won, and that's where the teams are are made at that point. So this will be good. This will be a good. Uh, you're right. It'll be a good. It'll be a good test. I'm excited to for that one. And also, I was just wondering how many American athletes are actually going to run in Diamond Leagues before the Olympic trials. And now we know at least one. But you're right. Richardson is a great candidate for it because you know, she ran so fast. She doesn't need. She didn't need to really prove anything in terms of like fitness or, or getting sharp, but just the big moments and racing against the big people would definitely help her out as she goes into the the, the trials and then the, the, the Olympics if she qualifies. For oh, sure. men's fifty sure. Monkey Jam brings up men's fifteen hundred in Monaco. Yeah, we'll probably we'll probably see it there. But the thing is with the fifteen hundred, you never know who the top four people are. You know who the fastest PBs are, but you don't know ever who's gonna be in top four at the the world championships, but you could definitely see Inga Britson and Chariot in there. And then if you have those two, you at least know that you have the top two currently. Can I do some unbreaking of news? Sure. So it's it unbreaking. Good? I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, so you know how I've been floating the idea that Shelby will run the 10 K. Oh, you're walking this back. No, I'm not walking it back. Um, I'm, I'm telling you it's not happening. But I will tell you, there was plans for it to happen, but those plans have since changed, and now it's not happening. What happened? Which is unfortunate. Just change the plans. I, I don't have the reasoning. I just know that it was on the docket, but now it's off the docket. But what's Bowerman? What I do, do. What I do know is, like, when are they going to race? Well, they'll probably run at Sound. Okay, I didn't see them on the entry festival. Or Portland Track Festival. I don't know. You know, Jerry, he'll just show up and be like, can I come in? They'll be like, yes. He doesn't have to follow the rules, right? He can just do whatever he wants. He can, he can do his own track meet. He'll be like the Bowerman he Classic. Where he doesn't get that $50 late fee on the registration portal? No, portal. he doesn't. No? But, Waived? Well, Shelby's not doing the 10K this year. The 10K is, though, in her future. That's all I can say about that. So the thing is, nobody believes you anymore. You lost all credibility on the show. No, I'm you telling you, source. You. No, you, it, it is so a common timeline to say you're going to do something and then not do it. That happens. Yeah. And that's what happened. And now, but I do know that eventually she's going to do it, and she's not just going to do it to like she's going to run fast. Like she can pretend. Well, but that's for not like an news. American record. Like a- athlete moves up in distance isn't news. Athlete runs random other event as a as a safety in case they don't make it in their primary event. That's a little more newsworthy. 
I'm saying you were reporting that. That's why I'm disappointed, Gordon. You said it. You prefaced what? it with, hey, listen, everybody. Press hey, record. I'm trying to correct the record right now. It's only May 3rd. The trials are end of June. Like, I'm getting out ahead of it. It's better than just sitting just, on it and not doing anything about it. So, Just lost. Just lost some credibility here. Okay, so you think Bowerman is going to run at – oh, you know what? I think they might run at Mount Sac, at least some of them. Because they put out, so here, you'll, you'll like this. This is some good Instagram sleuthing for you, Gordon. And you, I know you like Instagram sleuthing. Uh, on the podcast we record with Justin Knight, you know, he talked about how he's the best basketball playing Disney turner out there. And yeah. I, asked him, I said, what about Josh Thompson? Because he can dunk. And he's like, oh, yeah, you know, Josh and I were kind of going back and forth before the Texas meet about it. Da, 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 da. Well, Bowerman this past week, they put a video out like them talking during their long run and they were they brought up like oh josh is going to challenge justin knight to a one-on-one game like he tagged him on instagram and they said they're like after the mount after mount sac let's let's do it and then mohamed's like no no, no before mount sac you guys should do it which i thought was funny the idea of like them in a parking lot before like an hour before a 1500 just going hard so that made me think at least josh thompson is going to run the mount sac meet do all the other Bowerman people come? I have no idea. They could definitely split the squad. I just think that it's like you got this weekend. You, yeah, you got the Sound Running Meet. You got Portland Track Festival. It just feels like we should be seeing something soon, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, Bowerman is notorious for not running often, right? They love to kind of do like one race a year, <laughs> right? I mean, no, they do more than that. They, I, were, they were willing to let Woody Kincaid jog a 5K. Instead of trying to get the standard. And even though you got I'm looking at when team. Shelby – I want to see when Shelby debuted in 2019 because I think this is – I think this is late even by their standards. The trials are in six weeks. I just think it's – so Shelby outdoors last year, a pre on June 30th, July – oh, wow, yeah, you're right. Oh, man, she never ran. Holy cow. Yeah. They don't run. So she did they, they she she debuted with pre I'm not counting indoors June 3rd now it was later that year remember cuz 2019 359 at pre on June 30th and then July 9th Azusa Sunset Tour she ran a 159 800 and then I think she rabbited the 5000 and then it was literally USA's so they ran two meets Yeah, trusting the training. It's not good. I like it. Well, it's not good though. I, cool. I mean, Who's yeah, another? It works, Maybe. But, like, we need to set up a system where that shouldn't be like, uh, the. It shouldn't. We should figure out a way to set up our sport where we're not um. What's the word? Uh, tempted, not tempted. Um. Incentivized to do that because basically. Fireman's incentivized to run less because it helps them be their best for the trials. And if it works, it works. And there's no shame in doing what works for you. But the problem is, like, they need to figure out a way to maybe make it. So, I don't know. Maybe we need to rethink the way we do trials. Maybe it shouldn't be all but just so like one race. The, maybe, maybe it should be multiple races. Maybe it should be like But a, here's, what Tom, here's what Thompson did, though. Here's what Thompson did in 2019. He ran uh, a 1,500 in, at Oxy in the middle of may then the beginning of june he ran a steeple which was his last steeple i think then the beginning of june or end of june he ran in in eugene then he ran at sunset tour then he ran at portland track festival and then he ran at usa's so he basically ran five meets before trials which i think five is a solid number yeah but he's also more of a less experienced person so Someone like Shelby, to, yeah, Shel- yeah, he was chasing standards and stuff like that. And Shelby's just like, I just need to show up and win. So, yeah, I get it, I do get it, but maybe we should figure out a way to make our regular season a little more fun. It's just interesting because the there's, there's, well, there's all these, uh, there's all these meets now, right? It was before, it was like there weren't many meets, and now there's all these meets. Yeah. And you just expect everybody to show up because they're they're available and, and they look like they are 
appealing, right? They're geographically convenient and they have good fields. I'm looking at Thompson in 2018. Well, that's different because there's a champ. There's no, no global championship, but yeah, I guess it's just different for different people, right? Like I remember last year when we were looking at, remember Nike did the thing where they made him run because they needed the 10 race minimum. And we went, we went through and it was funny how like eerily close Centro always was to 10 races. And I didn't think it was a thing until I actually went through and I was like, oh, he raced nine times this year and like 10 times this year and like 12 times that year. There was no, it didn't, it didn't seem to deviate much. Um, we got one question before we go on one of your favorite runners. So I'm going to leave this one to you. It's from Max. It says, thoughts on Zuhair Talby, NAIA runner from Oklahoma City University, running 1328 and taking down a pro field at Trials of Miles. First of all, it's not my favorite runner. That is Lincoln Strike's favorite runner. Uh, but you know about Zuhair, though. It's like, I don't know. I keep on thinking about what if he would have gotten that academic eligible for Florida State and he could have been on the Florida State team and he would have kind of also been in the mix with my love for the 5K, right? It would have been wild, but... <laughs> Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'm not going to lie. Breaking 1330 doesn't mean much anymore, right? It's just mm-hmm. like it's it's like the four-minute mile. It's like, all right, cool. You can do what everyone else can do, like run three, sub 355 now, right? And I think that's yeah. in the in the 5K, it used to be like, whoa, third, sub 1330 is like super elite for a college kid. And now I think like in order to be – the best of the best, you need to now be sub 1320. I think it's just everything got shifted 10 seconds. Now, some people mm-hmm. will say it's because of a certain type of shoe company uh, putting things on people's feet that change it up. Um, but, it, yeah, I think it's weird. It's weird how 1328s just don't mean anything anymore. I mean, I remember freaking out in, like, 2014 or 15 at Peyton mm-hmm. Jordan – when like Ben True and Hassan Mead ran like 13-0. And I was like, yeah, oh my yeah. God, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. And now it's yeah. like, all right, all the best can run 13-0. Mm-hmm. And if you want to be the best best, you need to run 1250s. And we've yeah. been seeing that kind of trend over the past year or so. So yeah, 1328 to me is now just like a a data point on, a, on a, an Excel chart. It's not really anything that opens my eye. That's just my I opinion. mean, we literally, yeah. Well, and and then you have like the very, the very, the very top pushing it even faster, right? So like on the women's side last year, we saw a world record in the women's five. And then you saw Houlihan and Schweizer run those one, two American times, right? Put it into the 1420s. And then the men's side, you saw Joshua Chepta guy. So not only is like, yeah, 13, 15, 13, 25 becoming more and more common, but the fastest time, which we always tend, I think, just as track fans to kind of orient ourselves around. It's like, oh, you hear, like, when you know Shelby runs 1420, whatever, all of a sudden, like, 1505 just doesn't seem as fast as it did before, just because yeah, we think we orient ourselves around the fastest, the fastest time. And it happens, you know, and events go in waves and stuff, so it's not always just like, well, Kennedy Bekele ran that that fast, but that was like you know you can always kind of chalk that up to history. It's kind of it's kind of like what you're seeing that happens uh, around you more recently that makes you kind of kind of question it. But toby has been running well, man. He ran that he won that 10k out here, and he he does this stuff with a lot of uh, like a lot of solo efforts. Like he was hitting his watch in this one too. It was uh it was impressive. Um, yeah, Gordon was all on the Talby to Florida State train like two years ago when he thought it was going to happen. He had all of his projections, all the scoring charts yeah. were out there. That's why. Oh, yeah. Speaking <laughs> of projections, I, I need to update uh, NCA and USA rankings, which I won't do this week. Basically, mm-hmm. I'm not going to update anything until Monday of next week, likely, uh, and also update that who has the standard, who doesn't. That probably won't all get updated to next week. So two-week break. Okay with my stats because I'm in a desert. So. All right. Well, we'll let you uh, go back to the desert. Flow track podcast at gmail.com is the email address. Subscribe to the show on YouTube, the flow track podcast, YouTube channel or the flow track YouTube channel, or heck just do both of them. You can find the show wherever you listen to audio. 
podcasts as well or on the site flowtrack.org. Gordon, uh, you're off on Wednesday, I believe, but we'll figure some stuff yep. out and we'll be back two more times this week. Go Sixers. Later, guys. Stop. Stop. I'm a Bucks fan. <laughs> Lifelong Bucks fan.